welcome to another edition of Forum for a Better Understanding, actually the 255th program that we've been able to bring you what we think is a provocative, stimulating, and very interesting program, usually with multiple guests. But when you really do well and don't have to get a panel, but in one person can bring a guest who can actually be a forum for a better understanding him or herself, that's a real gift. And today, that's what we have. As the past two weeks, we've had one guest share with us the gifts of Islam. Today, we have a guest who is going to represent for us the whole opening to the Celtic Christian world and how, through his work and ministry, he may unpack some of that and let us see what it could mean for discipleship today all across the globe. Our guest is Reverend Dr. Peter Miller, who is from that esteemed and very, very special place called the Iona Community off the coast of Scotland. We've heard of the Christian brothers in Iona, and now we have one of those persons that has been a leading force in that community. It's a privilege to have been inviting Peter to be here. He came as an indirect gift, actually, from University Presbyterian Church through the person of um, Reverend Dr. Chris Erdman, the pastor there, who said, I think I have someone I could share with you on the forum. And on that note, <laughs> Peter, <laughs> you're coming, <laughs> sitting in for a panel. Being I'm able the panel. I'm the panel. <laughs> Can you be the panel <laughs> <I'm> today? The <laughs> Tell us just a little bit about your world traveling. One thing about a person is sometimes we find them, they're rooted here in the valley. You are on a visit to the valley. Tell us what you do when you're not helping out at University Presbyterian Church? Well, it's great to be here, Jim, actually. Um, thanks very much. And uh, as you said earlier, I'm a member of the IONA community. And so um, that community is now in many countries. So a lot of my work recently has been actually helping enabling communities in different parts of the world. And I've spent a lot of time recently in Australia, where we have a growing community. And these communities are not necessarily carrying the name Iona community, but they, but they carry the inspiration of an engaged theology and an engaged spirituality. What is this Wellspring community in Australia for the marginalized and the poor? What do you do there? Well, the Wellspring community is a dispersed ecumenical community in Australia. But many of its members are engaged um, in their own lives with asylum seekers, with people in poor areas of Sydney and Melbourne and so forth. So it depends on the life story of the members of Wellspring and the associate members. But there is in both our communities, I mean, really from in the Iona community and in related communities, a concern that Christ is revealed through the marginalized and the broken of his world. And where are some other places? I know you've been in India. You've yeah, been in the Middle East. Sure. Where do you want to help us see different places in this world that you have been finding yourself ministering and also hearing the cries of the poor across the world? Well, I think, I think it begins with an understanding, which comes from my owner, that actually this is God's world, that the ordinary matters, that we're together in the world. In other words, that we see through the secular, God's work in the world. And I think that, so it's, and that's really the basis of the Iona community rule, our commitment, which has actually got roots in the Benedictine tradition, and so I think that where we go in the world is actually to, I would say, we're trying to be presence of solidarity in many places of suffering. I mean, not so long ago, I was living in a township in South Africa, for instance, where, the, where there's 40% you know, of people of AIDS. Wow. Now, we're asked to, to go to these places, just like other people, to, to be there as a presence, I think. But the presence is understood by the theology. I mean, we're not just going there for the no. sake of it. <laughs> no. And, and, and the theology, I think I want to throw a phrase at you from yeah. your book, um, Our Hearts Still Sing, by Peter Miller, a very beautiful book that I recently purchased when I was there at University Presbyterian. And there's a section at the very beginning that I think is well worth having you unpack. It's from Ron Ferguson. And it says something sure. that I find perfectly suited to the season, we're in the Paschal season at this point, and it's going to bring up the idea of sacrament, which is what we are celebrating during this wonderful mystagogic oh. time. Here's what Ron Ferguson, a former leader of the community, said. To become aware of the sacramental nature of the cosmos, 
to be open to the sacramental possibilities of each moment, to see the face of Christ in every person. These things are not novel, but their rediscovery is the beginning of our health. Tell us about Ron and tell us about his sacramental theology, which I'm sure is underneath all of your world travel. Ron Ferguson is a leader in the church in Scotland. He was leader of the Anna community some years ago, and he's a writer and uh, many other things, a playwright and so forth. But I think that passage that you've read out, and incidentally, Jim, this book, Our Hearts Still Sing, is being used this year in many Catholic dioceses, Roman Catholic dioceses across America, with, with the peace and justice, the engaging spirituality out of Louisville, I think it is. Nice. And, and this book is being used by many, many groups across the states, as it happens. But I think the sacramental, I think, the, I think it is that this is God's world, that the world is the place of God's abiding. So in itself, it's a sacrament. And so is, is it to see, I think the, the section you, you wrote, read just now, is, it, is the world the place of God's light and hope and energy? So it's a sacrament in itself. And to see the, the cosmos, to see the world as that, and of course this goes back to the work of people like Deshardan and sure. Bede Griffiths, who was a great friend of mine in India. I mean, is to, is to, is to understand the, a, a deep revelation of God. When we celebrated Good Friday together sure. at church, uh, uh. the whole service was entitled, um, let's see how it was very beautifully <laughs> worded. <laughs> that was not my word. The <laughs> Crucified God walking among the wounded of the world, mm. which was Chris's title, mm. but which that whole evening, the theme with you and he leading the worship, was able to really make us aware as we were contemplating the crucified God on, the, uh, on Good Friday, you walked us through part of this world of ours. How much is that typical of what is this uh, effort of the Iona community, and also our topic today, this Celtic Christianity. You may want to just help us understand sure. something about Iona and something about the Celts sure. and that whole approach of these specific type of spirituality from the um, sure. Celtic people. Just very briefly, Columba came to the island of Iona in the year 563 in the 6th century. And he came with his monks from Ireland and set up a small monastery there. And, of course, um, that became a place of pilgrimage. And, of course, Columba died in 597. He, um, many, many people found then through the years uh, uh, as Iona as a place of healing. But I think, right, you were asking, Jim, about the Celtic understanding. When I'm asked about that, to put it very simply, it is that connection to God to, er to the earth, to the good earth, not in some romantic way, but to the earth and to one another. It's a kind of Trinitarian formula, that. And I think what's so interesting is that if we look, the Celtic church was a church of prayer. It was before, as you know, the Catholic church later came, the Roman Catholic church later came to Britain. But I think there were many strands in that early Celtic Christianity, um, the sense of mystery, the, the closeness to the earth. Um, if you give, for example, I've got here a prayer, um, you know, these beautiful prayers, which if I could just read one, um, I read it yesterday at church. May the raindrops fall lightly on your brow. May the soft winds freshen your spirit. May the sunshine brighten your heart. May the burdens of the day rest lightly upon you. And then it goes on to say, and may God enfold you in the mantle of his love. Now that is that, um, and it's deep in the Irish tradition, the Scottish tradition, being held in the nature of God. And I love that, actually. And of course, it's, it's so modern because people want to know they're held, actually. And I think that also the understanding in the Celtic, deep at the, 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 at the heart of the Celtic Christian Church, was the understanding that faith is a journey, a pilgrimage. And of course, that's a very contemporary idea. And it's the journey into God, but it's also the journey to one another. And so right from that early beginning, even in that monastery, and of course Mother Teresa articulated this beautifully in Kolkata, we see in the face of the stranger the face of Christ. We don't just see any face, we see the face in the image of God and so on. And I think another thing, just very briefly, is that the Celtic Church lived with the idea of provisional, provisionality. 
If you go back to the island of Iona, for instance, there are no buildings left from that period, none at all. They were just very simple. They were all destroyed by the Viking invasions in the 10th, 9th, 10th centuries. But I think that it was, it was the provisionality that, that, that life is a mystery, that, that, it, that, you know, often religion can be very functional and very permanent. But of course, Christ is permanent, but the way of expression is a provisionality often. That's a controversial point, of course. It, well, yeah, and what was so <laughs> special, I think, about the way you were leading the worship on Good Friday with the prayer sheets, yeah. the readings you did choose, the way that there was a dialogue and an engagement with the community, with something that began with one set of sheets that was set up as the service, and then the special part that would have been your gift. Do you want to help us see how any of what we did on Good Friday would be helping our viewers today appreciate during this Paschal season that we're involved in as believers, how God is truly present among us, truly holding us in his hands, and how this message can never be clear enough. It can never be um, stressed enough, especially in a world that is harsh, stark, and brutal sure. at times. The daily news does not seem to give us an Easter message. Whereas we are an Easter people, our song is Alleluia. Do you want to work with any of those ideas for our viewers to appreciate the gift of the Iona community to this world of ours? Well, I think the Iona community, first of all, is a community that celebrates life. And life has both pain and struggle. And I think that the modern understanding that life is going to be a bland experience, of course, has not helped people. And we see this today in the disconnection of family life and so many other things. Uh, pain is at the heart of human experience, as is joy. So that's where I would say, Jim, our incarnational theology is important. Yeah. So we take, for instance, as Desmond Tutu, who's been a great friend of the Iona community for so long, I mean, Desmond Tutu would say that even in the midst of violence of disconnection, we always see compassion and light. So it's not a case of eradicating hope. It's seeing hope through the struggle. And there's a beautiful, um, there's a beautiful image of that in the University Presbyterian Church here in Fresno, where there's, there's 1,200 prayers um, hanging from the ceiling. And these prayers um, express people's struggles and hopes, maybe somebody with cancer or disconnection in their family. But actually, through the prayers, we see the cross. So we, yep. we look through the prayers to yep. the cross. I love that. Because, of course, that's both hope, resurrection, and struggle. And I don't see how the two can be lost. My elder son is in charge of landmine detonation in Afghanistan today, wow. which is a horrific job in the world. But he is also a person of hope. He's not doing, I mean, we're not just hopeless. I mean, Afghanistan is a very difficult it's, situation. Yeah. But I think that... I think that an incarnational theology allows us to see both. Now, by that I mean, this is God's earth. God is present. This is not a dress rehearsal. We're not in some abstract world that we know nothing about. And I think that is quite contrary, if I may say so, to a theology which wants actually to escape from the world. Yeah. The world is essentially a bad place, so we must escape from it. How can the world be? This is the, the world of God's creating. And so that's what makes it exciting. And I love uh, some of the stuff you were referring to the Good Friday service. But often in these places of terrible pain, and I've seen this in so many parts of the world, we life. We mustn't just equate life with, with goodness or comfortable living or something like that. So I see both the cross and, the, and Good Friday and Easter Sunday as realities. And, and we have to, I think we have to hold them both. And I think going back to the Celtic world, what I love about that world, we mustn't romanticize it. There's hundreds, I mean, there's a huge worldwide interest in Celtic Christianity, but, it, but it, we mustn't, that was a life of struggle of, I mean, if you live in that climate, even now on the islands of Scotland, it's not an easy, it's no. not an easy thing. Rugged. And it's rugged. And these people, they, they, these great missionary journeys that took them to Central Europe from these tiny monasteries scattered across Britain, I mean, there were journeys of huge struggle, but there were journeys of hope. They were taking, they were carrying hope. And that is, I think, what the modern world is, is, is seeking so much. People want to, under, they want to accept their pain, but they also want to know that in it there is hope. That's, the great, that's the great contradiction in a way, I think. 
what we have to do right now, they're telling me, is take our one minute break, but don't go anywhere. Maybe get a pen so that when we come back, you'll be able to see uh, the website for Iona that we want you to go to. But right now, take that little break and we'll be right back in one minute. KNXT, the nation's only full-powered broadcast station owned and operated by a Catholic diocese in the U.S. and streaming live on the Internet at KNXT.TV. Need your support to keep the message of the good news alive. Just go to KNXT.TV, click on the Make a Financial Gift, go to Donate, and fill out your one-time or monthly offering under PayPal. It's just that easy. Your donation makes it possible for KNXT, Catholic Television, to continue its ministry by celebrating the Mass and proclaiming the Gospel. Thank you from KNXT. Welcome back to the second part of a conversation that I am so excited about. We have a special guest in the studio today, all the way from Australia, by way, well, from Scotland by way <laughs> of Australia, but um, passing through Fresno, it, it was part of his journey. And we want to have Peter Miller tell us some more about the Iona community. So he'll begin by introducing us also to the website where you will go and be able to find so many resources and so many further things about what it is that he's only going to be able to touch on a little bit. Peter, thanks for being here yeah, with us today. Good, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about the Iona Abbey and that uh, sure. beautiful website that you sure. can share with us. The, uh, the Iona website is uh, www.iona.org.uk. And if you want to find more, you can find it on What that. might they find there, Peter? And I think they'll find... Um, the roots of the modern Iona community, which is uh, the largest ecumenical community now in the modern world, ecumenical being Catholic and Protestant, I mean Great. by that. And also a dispersed community, so we're not living on the island of Iona. A few members live yeah. there, but we're all across the world. And of course we have many associates and friends in America, some of whom I'm visiting on this trip. And we're also hoping to start a new um, inspired uh, Iona uh, inspired community here in America. We're hopeful of that. There's a new foundation group looking at that. And just to say for a moment, Jim, because you were asking, I think what holds it all together is actually the rule, like any other religious community. And the rule is fivefold, our attention to scripture and to prayer, our, um, our accounting for the use of our money, our accounting for the use of our time on earth, our commitments to peace, to justice, to mission, um, to healing, um, and lastly, our, our accountability to one another as within the community. And so that yeah. fivefold rule holds all our, our, our work together. That's why we hold together mission and healing, uh, uh, involvement in the world and the issues of the world, but also the issues of people. So the modern community, which dates back to the 1930s in Scotland, which came out of the Depression, actually, in Scotland, and for 30 years we rebuilt the, the, the great monastic buildings, the Benedictine buildings Beautiful. on Iona, which date from the 13th century. So they've been rebuilt, and that's our spiritual center. And, of course, many thousands of people come there every year from all over the world for programs and things. You know, one thing I wanted to say, and I'm just a name dropper on this one, <laughs> is John Bell. And anyone who has done any of the music of John Bell, which winds up being almost a way to get to the world's heart through music from all over the world. Now, there's that wonderful thing on the YouTube that I've been able to see where you take a tune and you see it played all across the universe. Well, what's also going on with the people like John Bell from yeah, your community sure. He winds up finding out from the indigenous peoples of so many the different country, places yeah. melodies and tunes that become on his CDs, which are from the Iona community, from that wonderful name, the Wild Goose Publications, which means the Holy Spirit. And I love the idea that when you, I Spirit. love the idea that when someone says, yeah, "That's like a wild goose chase," a wild goose chase is 
having the Holy Spirit guide your fractured life. What a what a wonderful it's turn an image. Of, yeah, what an great, image that I, I like the image of the geese. You know, the leader of the geese always changes. So our community leadership always changes. It's not standard. And they're God. wild. <laughs> it's it's not pretending to be the orderly no. geese. Yeah. These are the wild Do geese. Do you think you're a wild goose? You're I not. think so. And I think I feel happy about that because it's part of this Celtic thing yeah, we have. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I think but I think that that's there are two things there also, Jim, that we're also held. We're held in accountability as a community because the geese always move together. They're not like the heron or they're not a single bird, and, a, and that's a very important thing. And I think also that that raises a huge question, which I write about often in my own books, is about the privatized nature of Christianity in the modern world. Is it only a private? Is it only us, our relationship to God that matters? That is important. But is it also... If we're in Christ, what about our compassion for the world, for one another? And that's so important, I think. What, what I really enjoyed, and it's going to be, for me, something to go back to and learn way more mm. about, the word accountability. Yeah. I loved how you put it out there right away, and then we have five things accountable. Scripture and prayer. Well, everyone does that, you'd say. Like, that's like the easy one. Money. It's not so easy. <laughs> oh, that was a prickly one. And what it is is that in the middle of this economic crisis that the world is in, there's been no accountability. Everyone's been, as they say, a wild goose on their own. And then this ability of accountability of time. Mm. So many of us, myself especially, we love our time and love to use it as we wish to use it and find people intruding on our time, if not our money. And then these four commitments to peace, justice, mission, and healing not one of them, but all four. Yeah, sure. And then finally, to say as a mission statement, we are committed to an accountability to one another. Yeah. What a challenging accountability the community has for itself. Yeah. I mean, that's a high bar. Well, but in all things, like in all communities, isn't it a vision? You hold the vision. Boy. And without the vision, we perish. At least the Bible says that. Exactly. And you all believe the Bible oh, here. You know, so. Word of God. <laughs> But I mean, I mean that serious. I mean, we have, we need vision, and I think that I think that a lot of modern Christianity lacks accountability, yeah. actually, and oh, yeah. and our accountability to one another. What do we do with the world's resources? What do we do with our own resources? We could talk about this for many hours, actually. But the but the great thing is these we, these are gifts that we're given. They're not they're not here forever. No. And I think that one of the things that being in the Anna community has taught me is both the personal nature, the, the, the importance of our spiritual life as, as individuals, but also that we're the body of Christ. And I love the fact that we're ecumenical, that we hold together both Catholic and oh, Protestant yeah. brothers and sisters, and um, that's important. We just did a show on the other program called Yesterday, Today, and Forever about sure. Taizé prayer. Yeah. And what was so enlightening to me and what was so refreshing to see in the studio, six different people, not only sharing their own commitments from their local churches, which included several of the many local communities, but also clips all the way from Taizé reminding us of the power of ecumenical prayer sure. and ecumenical song. Mm. I just am so glad that two weeks in a row or two, at least two months in a <laughs> row, we're able to celebrate the ecumenical quality of our sure, relationships. That's wonderful. That's great. It's just and, something yeah. that we, we couldn't and, have done uh, this, as they say, before Vatican II, yeah. we wouldn't have been joining the effort. Sure. And I guess until the 30s, there wasn't this commitment of the Iona group no, either. No. The, the community really was Although born. Although the communities had a lot of links with the Coptic churches, because of course the Coptic church, it was the Egypt monks, the Egyptian monks in the third century that brought Christianity to Ireland. So we've had actually links with the Coptic Church in, in, wow. in the world as well. So that's an interesting historical link, I think. Now, in the few minutes that may be yeah. left, Peter, is there something about any of the books you've brought, any of your own books that you might like to introduce us to, or a reading or a prayer that might be one thing that we didn't want to lose this chance for you to open up something that you are wanting to really share with us? We've got a few minutes left. We have... We welcome many people to Iona, Jim, and we have a little prayer, which is not, an, it's not necessarily a particularly old prayer, 
But I think it's a wonderful prayer about understanding the other, because the, the main problem of the modern world is who is the other? The other has become a stranger, a terrorist, an unknown person. Yeah. But of course, ultimately, we're all sisters and brothers. And this is, um, it's called a Celtic rune of hospitality, meaning a Celtic word of hospitality. And it goes like this, seeing you've asked me to read something, I'd oh, like to yes. read this. We saw a stranger yesterday. We put food in the eating place, drink in the drinking place, music in the listening place, and with the sacred name of the triune God, he blessed us and our house, our cattle and our dear ones. And as the lark says in her song, often, often, often goes Christ in the stranger's guise. Oh, it's almost Gerard Manley Hopkins. It's Christ one. plays in yeah, 10,000 yeah, exactly, faces. Yeah. It's, what is so beautiful about that is that something that will be ritually prayed sure, daily, sure, maybe? Sure. I mean, on is a, this. Well, we use it often on a Saturday where we welcome people to Iron Man. So, yeah, every Saturday. I would. I am so glad that this theme that we're seeing yeah. from the Celts might sure. be sacramental quality, incarnational quality, and seeing Christ. In every, sure, in every person. being. Yeah. Uh, do you want to share with us, because you'll have it by heart and I don't, the um, prayer of St. Patrick that winds up having us challenged to kind of be aware that Christ is everywhere in our possibilities if only we would know he's ahead of us, behind us, to our left, to so our beside right. Beside us, beneath us, beside us, um, above us, below us. Beside us, these are all the words that, and, and of course that's the encompassing love of Christ for us all and for the world. Where is it that you would see in that opening prayer on Friday night, you asked us to chant out um, responses to certain countries to what we think um, might be typical of that country. Mm. I'd almost change it this way and give you uh, 30 seconds on this one. Pick a place that you think you could challenge our community who's watching to decide to pray and do something about specifically. This time, pick a country or pick a place where you would ask us to bring this love of Christ to that place. I would ask for the prayers for Zimbabwe, which is going through so much suffering. And our brothers and sisters there, Jim, need our prayers so badly today. We have just seen the Holy Father visit Africa. We want to focus instead on a different country in that continent, Zimbabwe, and to pray for the devastation of the people there and to ask that through not only our prayer, but through our action, we will witness to them and to our neighbors the loving power of God. God bless.